Dying, He loved me. Dying, He saved me. Buried, He carried my sins far away. Rising, He justified freely forever. So many blessings this week. We see them day in and day out. And we're asking for one more blessing, Lord. An open heart and an open mind. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, work and speak through Jim this morning to give us a lesson, something for us to carry forward as we go forth this week, something that will show us additional blessings that we can, again, praise and glory and worship you for, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Isn't this weather fantastic? It's just awesome. It's just awesome. I'm already getting the spring itch. I'll begin with a, with a couple of jokicisms this morning. That's a new word. A week after Beethoven's death, the cemetery's caregiver hears strange rustling sounds coming from the gravesite and sends for the gravedigger. I have trouble getting through this one. I'm sorry. I, I think of the punchline before I even get there. After, finishing fi- after finally digging down six feet, the gravedigger pulls the lid off the casket and peeks in to see Beethoven erasing sheets of music. The grave digger looks up at the caretaker and says, just as I thought, he's decomposing. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) At Sunday school, they were learning how God created everything, including human beings. Johnny was especially intent when the teacher told him how Eve was created out of one of Adam's ribs. Later in the week, his mother noticed him lying down as though he were ill and said, Johnny, what's the matter? Johnny responded, I have a pain in my side. I think I'm going to have a wife. (laughs) Well, today's sermon is um, a little bit of an uncomfortable subject for all of us. It's a little uncomfortable for me to give it, and it'll probably be a little uncomfortable for you to receive it. But it is God's word. It is God's word. You and I live in a society that says, don't judge me. I can do whatever I want, wherever I want. I am not accountable to anyone. If you don't agree with me, you're a so-and-so or so-and-so and so-and-so. I mean, we see that all the time on the news. I'm accountable to no one except myself and what I think is right. But the Bible says, as members of the church, as members of the body of Christ, we are accountable to each other. We are to keep each other in line. In Proverbs 27, 17, it's a beautiful verse. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. In other words, we're to keep each other's lives honed, if you will. Sharp. We're to provide guidance to each other. We're to provide resistance to each other going astray. We're to encourage each other. We are responsible to each other. You and I may be too close to a situation to see things clearly. And others can often help us to see from a clear perspective. I know myself that it's it's much easier for it's much easier for us to see flaws and things in someone else's life than it is our own, isn't it? It's really tough sometimes. But I, I, I find out that when I read through this, and, and uh, the Lord says, oh, look at that one right there, Jim, look at that. You know, don't you? We are to hold each other accountable, but also encourage each other. We're also very good at justifying our own sin, aren't we? Blind to our own faults. And this accountability, it's it's not to punish. There's such a negative connotation in the world about what accountability is. Accountability is responsibility, but it's also guidance and direction. It's having someone come alongside you when you're struggling with something and say, you know, you're, you're going in the wrong direction here. Go in this direction. And actually, where the church is concerned, we are, in a way, our brother's keeper. 
As members of the church, we have a mutual accountability to each other and to God. We're accountable to each other to live a Christian life. And this is not that we don't fall or slip, but that's when other Christians hold us up and help us back on the path of righteousness. We all sin, but we all need people standing by us to help us, to guide us and direct us and encourage us. That's why its church is so important. We can't make it on our own. If we see a Christian brother or sister slipping into sin, the Bible says that we have an obligation to speak to them and encourage them and help them to repent. This is not just the priest's job. The Bible says it's everybody's job. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, we read, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. As a part of the body of Christ, we are to support, encourage, and guide, and correct each other gently. That's a key word there, gently. In today's epistle, we read, If anyone is caught in any transgression... And Paul starts this by using the word brother, so he's talking to the church. If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Wow. So what is Paul saying here? Well, first of all, restore those caught in sin in a spirit of gentleness, knowing that you could fall too. Don't think yourself better than other Christians, because we all sin, we can all fall. Do not think that you are above that particular sin. I remember a sermon I heard years ago by Bishop Love. He says, look at the Ten Commandments. He says, at any time, in any particular situation, any of us could fall to one of those. I think it's true. Paul is further saying, help others to carry their struggles. We're to lift them up in prayer. We're to encourage them. And finally, he says, if you think you can never fall, you're deceiving yourself. In today's gospel, Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What Jesus is saying here is that each of us has a personal responsibility in being accountable to each other and keeping each other accountable and a personal responsibility in resolving our conflicts with others, not farming that out to someone else. So the question is, is, as a church, I don't think many of us have seen the church work this way, have we? So the question is, why don't we do this? Well, I was thinking and meditating on this, and I think I came up with a couple reasons. Number one is fear. We're afraid of what the other person might say or do. There's also the lack of trust in each other. Fear that someone might get mad at me. Fear that if I expose my weaknesses or my struggles to someone, I could get hurt. Or they might see me for who I really was. And if they see me for who I really am, they might not like me. I have to tell you personally, guys, I I deal with this. I'm as big of a sinner as anyone else here. And I have my weaknesses. I have my faults. We all do. But what 
what I think Paul is saying here and Jesus is saying here is that as part of the body of Christ, we need to be able to share those faults with others and tell people that we're struggling. This is an area of my life I struggle with. Can you help me? Can you pray for me? That's the way the church works. And not in a spirit of judgment, because we're, we all have things that we deal with. But unfortunately, in the attitude in the church, a lot of times is that, well, you, don't have, you have no right to tell me what to do. Proverbs 12, 15, Solomon says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. So if someone comes to us and says that they see a problem in our lives, we had best heed it. And if someone comes to us and says that we've hurt them or we're straying into sin, we are to take account of the situation. As members of the church, of the body of Christ, we're bound together in relationship of accountability. Otherwise, Jesus would not have said, take it to the church, would he? In 1 Corinthians 5, 2 through 5, as, as, as Steve read this this morning, I still, every time I read, I hear this, ver, this uh, passage, I'm shocked. It is a, it is a real, you know, like, like you're going through the service and all of a sudden these things are exposed. And it's, it's kind of, it's unnerving. But a man is living in the church, is living in blatant immorality. He's sleeping with his mother-in-law, and he's proud of it. The church is proud of it. The church is proud of it. And Paul writes, let him who has done this be removed from among you. And then he continues, he says, when you are assembled, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Wow. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? But it's what the word says. Paul's teaching on the New Testament speaks of mutual accountability among the members. Yes, the church leadership is responsible, but notice Paul is saying here, you tolerate this. You tolerate this. In other words, the entire congregation is accountable for allowing that sin to be tolerated, even celebrated in the Corinthian church. All of us in the church are responsible both to give and to receive encouragement, counsel, consolation, exhortation, and admonition. And all of this done in the spirit of gentleness. So what the Corinthian church should have done to this individual is go to him in a spirit of gentleness and say, look, this is not right. This is sinful. This is really, really bad. You need to repent and change your ways. If he, doesn't, if he decides not to repent, then the person that's approaching him takes two or three other people with him. If he still refuses to, the, to repent, then takes it to the, to the leadership of the church, and action is taken. But always in a spirit of gentleness, not in a spirit of anger or... Uh, waving your finger at somebody. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. And in Hebrews 3, 13, Exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I know that this is not a popular teaching. It's a difficult teaching. But if a church, if we are to be the church, this is how we need to function. It's hard, isn't it? It's hard for person A to go to person B and saying, there's something in your life that, that just doesn't look right. You need to repent. Can I help you? Offering a hand of help and support. So the goal at every step of this process is repentance and forgiveness and reconciliation for the good of the offender and the spiritual health of the church and the glory of Christ. This is where Matthew 18 comes into play. 
This is the way that we exercise mutual accountability according to Jesus. Throwing somebody out of the church, we say, well, that's not nice, is it? Jesus is telling us to exclude someone, isn't he? Yep. He's saying that we need to be accountable to each other, and if not, there are consequences. And this leads us to resolving conflicts in the church. Jesus, again, gives us a perfect model for resolving church disputes between members. Let's say, for instance, we have, and I chose names in particular that we didn't have here at church, Bonnie and Beth. And Bonnie says something to offend Beth. Beth gets very, very upset. Now, the chances are here that Bonnie didn't even know that she did anything. How often do we see that happen? We get upset with somebody, we get mad with somebody, we talk to them about it, and they're not even aware that they did anything to upset us. So what does Beth do? This is what we normally do. Beth complains to Mary and Diane and Wilma about what Bonnie did. Or Beth goes to the pastor and complains about what Bonnie did. They did this, you go tell them, make them apologize to me. Now the Bible says that Beth should go directly to Bonnie and confront her in a spirit of gentleness. What you said really hurt me. Instead, we ask for someone else to talk to her to fix the problem for us, don't, us, don't we? That's how the world handles conflict, and it doesn't work, does it? It's time that we really start acting like the church instead of acting like the world. And I'm not saying that this is easy. It isn't. But I have to tell you, as a pastor, as the pastor here, if someone comes to me and says, so-and-so did so-and-so to me, I'm going to say, you go talk to them. That's the way to handle this situation. If it's a really, really tough situation, I'll go with you. I'll be an arbiter if you want. But you're the one that has to make this gesture. It's biblical. So if someone comes to you and says, so-and-so did so-and-so, tell them to go talk to them personally. And again, most of the time, these offenses are unintentional. We all say and do things that are dumb and hurt people. We all do it, don't we? I know I do. Years ago... um, we were, um, I was working in the attic at the house, and, uh, excuse me, Ginny said something to me, and I don't remember what it was, but, and I was watching, the, the reason is, is this was on videotape, and I was watching the videotape years later, and I don't remember what I answered back, but at the time, it didn't seem like anything to me, but I listened to the videotape, and I was horrified at what I said. I didn't even realize it. I didn't even realize it. So we all do those things. We all do dumb things. Conversely, when someone approaches you and says that you've hurt them, extend grace, a spirit of gentleness. Work it out. I know it's hard, but this is Jesus' command. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. And I know we don't like confrontation, But it's exactly what Jesus is talking about. Gentle, healthy confrontation. That's how we grow and mature as Christians. And that's how we stay united. And as a passing note, we must be quick to ask for and grant forgiveness. It's very important. In Luke 17, Jesus says, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. So, summarizing Matthew 18. Go to the person whom you have something against, one-on-one. Talk to them in a spirit of gentleness. Step two, if they refuse to listen, take with you two or three witnesses. 
If they still refuse to listen, step three. If there's an unresolved problem, take it to the church leadership. And this also applies to someone in the church who's straying into sin, as we've mentioned before. Approach them gently. Approach them gently. I heard that you left your wife and that you're living with another woman. Is it true? If they don't listen, the behavior continues. Follow the next two steps. I've told you this story before, but I know of a woman whose husband was having an affair at the church with another member of the church. She was in the ordination process even. He and the woman he was having an affair with were on the vestry together. And everyone in the church knew about it except her. And when she found out, she was devastated, number one, because her husband was being unfaithful, number two, because everybody in the church knew about it. Nobody called him to account for it, and nobody told her. Now, do I, do I can I say absolutely that some, a woman should have come up to her and told her what was going on? I'm not sure about that. But what should have happened is the men in that church should have got together and said, look, man, to the, to the husband, this is wrong. You need to stop this, and you need to stop this right now. And then tell him to tell his wife to confess and ask forgiveness. That's what should have happened. Instead, she was devastated. She ended up leaving the church, going to another church. This all this is more than theory, guys. This is the way that the church remains pure. Remember, Paul said that a little yeast leavens the whole dough. As Christians, this is how we're to function in the church and as the church. And it's the way we will function here. Now, I want to end on a little bit of a positive note here. I got an email from CBN a few days ago. You, uh, I hope all of you are familiar with James Dobson, Focus on the Family. Um, he and his organization had a, a um, lawsuit against the admin Obama administration, actually, uh, regarding providing uh, the morning-after pill, abortion pills. And, uh, of course, he won a couple days ago. A uh, superior court ruled in his favor. But as I read the article... This is what he said when this legal battle began. He issued his own ultimatum to President Obama saying, to pay one cent for the killing of babies is egregious to me, and I will do all I can to correct a government that lies to me about its intention and then tries to coerce my acquiescence with extortion. It would be a violation of my most deeply held convictions to disobey what I consider to be the principles of Scripture. The Creator will not hold us guiltless if we turn a deaf eye to the eyes, to the cries of his innocent babies. So come and get me if you must, Mr. President. I will not bow before your wicked regulation. Isn't that cool? Amen. All right. Thank you. God bless. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Justify freely for